letting a little more yes. current flow in one direction than the other. Another thing that makes fusion harder. It's time for some more action lab. Specifically, this shouldn't curve. Why AC electricity doesn't behave the way you think. A problem that certainly confounds fusion engines. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't mention everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some out. Let's see. Hey everyone, I have a problem. Whenever I try to plug in a pickle, it sparks and lights up. The problem is the pickle preferentially lights up on one side. Don't you mean you have... Ah, so you're in a bit of a pickle with a pickle. So this pickle looks like he's having... So this pickle is not being a very good resistor. You're getting a partially ionized plasma discharge inside of it. In other words, once it starts glowing, Ohm's law isn't going to be doing you any favors. You're now operating in plasma electrode physics. This is the difference between joule heating in a fuel rod and plasma wall interaction in a tokamak. And gets hotter on one side than the other. Mm. And sometimes, depending on the pickle, it even randomly switches. Oh, well, he just recreated one of the reasons why nuclear fusion is in a bit of a pickle. Yeah, I promise this is the last time I'll make that joke. But this asymmetry that he's talking about is one of the dominant ways walls can become damaged in fusion reactors. And after all, if it were perfectly symmetrical, the Eater fusion project would be easier. Maybe not easy, but easier. And unfortunately, plasma physics can be non-linear. These pickles are not the same thing. They're, you got a fat, stubbier one, and then you got one that's more elongated. The roughness is a little different. All that's going to affect the plasma's ability to choose, for lack of a better word, a cathode. And this is the reason why tokamak plasmas have a tendency to suddenly get disrupted. This is an AC circuit. Yes. Shouldn't both electrodes act the same? Well, they should in linear, non-ionized systems. And also, your pickles aren't the same. I see the same problem when I hook up my Jacob's ladder, which oh. runs at high AC okay. voltage. One of the electrodes... Doing some electroboom adjacent experiments, are we? Nice. ...heats up more than the other. If you don't think this is weird, you should. AC is supposed to be symmetric. There's no positive or negative electrode. It's constantly switching. So that's true, but again, if you're in a system where things don't ionize. To give you a sense of scale with mass, electrons have a mass of about 9 times 10 to the minus 31 power kilograms. Whereas these ions, say hydrogen, sodium, that exist in your salty pickle, are on the order 10 to the minus 26, 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, give or take. So as much as five orders of magnitude in difference. That is very much asymmetrical. That's about the same difference between a golf ball and a wrecking ball. So that is to say the electrons and the ions do not have the same inertia. It swings from high positive to low negative and back again repeatedly. So whatever action one electron- A balanced symmetrical circuit, sure. ...is seeing, the other one should see it as well. In this video, I'm going to show you why whenever you have some AC plasma arc, you almost always have hidden DC currents inside of them. So plasma self-biasing. Fusion devices explicitly model this phenomena. And in the semiconductor world, this is exploited on purpose. Very underappreciated phenomena. This Jacob's Ladder uses a ZVS driver to make an AC voltage at tens of thousands of volts. Okay, here we alternating go. tens of thousands of times per second. So this is very much an alternating voltage. Now ZVS drivers are also not symmetrical, which is one of many reasons why Jacob Ladders are a little scary. Here. But let's run it for a bit and then measure the temperature of each- I mean, look at it. <laughs> ...electrode after it runs. Okay, I'll turn it off. Now let's measure the temperature difference between them. So after we run- Yeah, just, you could tell by just looking at the way the arcs travel up, it's not symmetric. You can see the top one, which is the left electrode, is at around 200 degrees Fahrenheit, while the right one is at 110 degrees. This oh, asymmetry wow. wouldn't make sense for a pure AC circuit. It's even further off than it looked, okay. <laughs> yeah, you don't want mismatches of 50-ish percent, high 40% in your reactor. I'm glad our reactors don't run like 
Jacob's Ladder it's where you have that much of an imbalance. You have some. Uh, there's some temperature mismatch to give you a sense in a typical pressurized water reactor. The hot leg's about 620 degrees, and the cold leg is about 560 degrees in Fahrenheit, just being consistent with what units he's using. And that's all engineered, supposed to be that way. I mean, after all, ultimately in a nuclear power plant, you want heat removal. You want there to be a temperature difference. And the cause of that temperature difference is you run it through a heat exchanger, that being the steam generator, where it takes the heat from the reactor and sends it to the main turbine, turns the generator, makes electricity. In fact, that temperature gradient, that delta T, is one of the ways to measure reactor power. This mismatch here, though, chaos. But then I remembered about welding. If you use a DC current, then the negative electrode or cathode will get about 70% of the heat, and the positive piece will get about 30% of the heat. Yes, that's why the electrode polarity matters in welding. It's also why tokamak diverters have a tendency to fail asymmetrically, because again, uneven heat distribution. The reason is due to something called a Debye sheath. In a plasma, we have two charged Named after Peter, Peter Dubai, not, has nothing to do with the city with the really big skyscrapers in the Middle East. Carriers, electrons and ions. Electrons have the same magnitude of charge as these ions, but they're about 50,000 times less massive. So if I have a negatively... Yes, the inertia is different. And this is a similar concept when you look at your neutron diffusion length when it travels through the reactor. And also when you look at the boundary layers in thermal hydraulics of going from one system to another when you look at your uh, heat transfer properties within the reactor, within the steam generators, that sort of thing. Charged electrode near a plasma, it blows the electrons away almost instantly. And what's left behind is a sheath full of positive ions now. These ions sit right next to the negatively charged cathode. And because the electrons are gone, the electric field there becomes enormous. Now just a few microns away from the surface, those heavy ions suddenly accelerate and smash into the cathode, dumping a huge amount of energy into it. That's what causes this intense heating. But and this intense heating is a lot. We're talking megawatts per square meter. That is to say, fusion-grade heat flux. Though, the thickness is on the order of micrometers, and the voltage drop is merely between tens to hundreds of volts. But yeah, this is another example of having something with a really big flux or a really big unit per other unit with essentially a household appliance. Another example would be those laser those handheld laser tattoo removals. Megawatts of power in your hand. The key is it's a pulse laser, so you're just dividing by a really small number. <laughs> On the other side, at the positive electrode, the anode, there's no similar buildup. The ions don't get blown away like the electrons did on the other side. So electrons are slowed down before they hit the surface due to these ions. And because electrons are so light, they don't transfer nearly as much energy as well. So in DC plasmas, the cathode heats up dramatically, while the anode barely heats up at all. And that's why cathodes erode more faster. I've heard the phrase electrons bounce and ions slam. Even though the same current is flowing through both of them. But that's for a DC current. This Jacob's Ladder should be AC. Could it be that there's Ish. some DC component to this? <laughs> well, I can easily check if there's some direct current going through these wires. Remember that when you have a moving charge passing through a magnetic field, the Lorentz force causes that charge to curve. So if I set up my... The old right-hand rule, remember in electrodynamics classes. Electrodes so that I have a center electrode surrounded by a circular outer electrode and turn it on, you see a normal spark, exactly what we'd expect. But when I move a magnet underneath, watch this. It mm. starts moving around in a circle. Also, if I flip which direction is facing up on the magnet, the rotation direction changes. That's cool to if watch. this were purely AC, the current would just alternate back and forth. So there would be no net charge movement, so there would be no curvature. The plasma would just wiggle, but we clearly see circular motion here. 
That's a really good explanation of that. Yeah, definitely saying there is some sort of net charge transport somewhere. So this means that there's a slight DC current in the ZVS circuit, or there's something about the electrodes themselves that's turning some AC into DC. So let's check if it's the ZVS driver that has some DC component. The easiest way to do this is to switch which wire is connected to the ring. And sure enough, you can see that if I switch the wires, then the ring rotates the opposite direction. Nice. So that means that the current reversed. I looked this up and sure enough, ZVS drivers are known to have a slight DC component to them. So th this is the same reason why precision plasma systems cost millions and your fusion RF sources are really, really complex. You have to account for these sort of things. It's a shame we don't live in an ideal math world where <laughs> AC stays symmetrical the whole way, right? Though that would change a few fundamental things like, I guess, ions being similar size to electrons. Uh, that that wouldn't work out pretty good. That answers why one electrode was heating more than the other in my Jacob's ladder. But what if I use a high voltage source that shouldn't have a DC bias? This is a neon sign transformer. Oh, it outputs right. about six kilovolts at 40 kilohertz. There's no obvious positive or negative terminal here. So let's try the magnet test again. It still moves in a circle. That's weird. This is supposed to be pure AC. Why do I still see a DC current causing it to move around in a circle? <laughs> well, maybe perfect. it's still coming from the electronics inside this transformer that's pushing a little bit of a DC bias. Well, when I switch okay. the wires on it, the direction switches again. So even electronic neon sign transformers have a small DC bias to them. It's this less, is because it first converts not. AC into DC with a rectifier and capacitor, and then electronically switches then that DC it. back into AC. You see that on a lot of control circuits within the nuclear power plant, and that's mainly for signal cleanup. After all, you want nice clean signals to do the important thing, like give automatic input, like give automatic input to your reactor protection systems that is to say the things that tell you to emergency shut down the reactor well they don't just tell you they do it they do automatic reactor trips to put the equipment in a safe condition when you exceed certain set points so yeah you want those instruments to not have much in the way of noise which is why you run it through those types of setups and that switching is never perfectly balanced so you get a slight more push in one direction than the other making a small dc current but can we just try this with a pure ac wave without any induced dc bias from electronics well, I got yet another neon sign transformer, but this one is an old fashioned iron core type. So there's no way that there can be any electronics making there be a DC bias. Interesting. Now let's see if we still see some curvature near the magnet. Now with this one, the pulsing is a lot faster, so it's harder to form a constant plasma. So it doesn't move in a circle. So we can't look at the rotation. Oh, we have to right. look at the curvature of the sparks that are bending. If I freeze it on each spark, you can see that it bends with the arc pointing clockwise most of the time. Okay. And this time I know that there's no DC bias coming from the transformer itself because there are no electronics to cause it. And even when I switch the wires, it doesn't change the direction that the spark bends. This means that somehow there's still a DC current that gets pushed naturally due to the geometry of the electrodes themselves. To understand- Trying to get things perfectly symmetrical is really hard to do. So not only, and this again goes back to the point of us not being in perfect circle land. Why, let's slow time way down and look at what's happening during this very fast voltage spike. So this center wire is sharper, so it creates a stronger electric field, and it emits electrons way more easily than the ring. And then the voltage swings the other way, but the ring can't release as many electrons. That tiny difference means that the center wire heats mm. up slightly more each swing. And because it's hotter, it emits electrons even more easily on the next cycle. So that lets more current through, which heats it up more, which lets even more current through. This feedback keeps going and going until that has now been chosen as the cathode. Let me show you this graph to explain what I mean. The red line is the AC current that's constantly swinging back and forth, and the blue line is the average direct current. For true AC, the average is zero. But if one side of the AC wave lets through a little more current, then watch what happens to the average current. It becomes non-zero. So there's a slight average DC current that happens now. So the plasma actually ends up acting like a uh, tiny diode, letting a little more yes. current flow in one direction than the other.
So breaking this symmetry like this is somewhat similar to boiling instability in reactors, albeit that's a thermal thing rather than an electrical thing. But yeah, this self-bias formation here, this is why we can't have perfect plasma. Another thing that makes fusion harder. So a DC bias forms naturally purely from geometry. In this case, there's a large difference between what these two electrodes look like. But no matter what, there will always be slight asymmetries between two electrodes. So now we're finally ready to understand my pickle lamp. A pickle is never perfectly symmetric. I was gonna say, it'd be like, assume the pickle is perfectly spherical. This is back to the old spherical cow assumption that was a bit of a joke at some engineering schools that when discussing the ideal case, you have to make ridiculous, unrealistic assumptions like a spherical cow. So your ideal, symmetrical, perfect model would work. Um, this is also true for nuclear reactor design, because ideally you would have a perfectly spherical core if you want your power distribution to be 100% the same. But it's just not practical to make a perfect or nearly perfect sphere reactor vessel. It's like, yeah, go ahead and go with a more cylindrical type design and intentionally make your fuel distribution non-uniform on purpose and vary the control rod height, put in burnable absorbers, that is to say, that go away over time over core life, because the power distribution is going to change a little bit over the course of an 18 to 24 month fuel cycle. So you have to design things with this sort of idea in mind, which is why at ITER, at any other fusion facility, the um, Wendelstein 7X, they're trying to go for symmetrically on purpose, but that's why they have a crazy looking spirally cruller design rather than a basic tokamak donut so they can try to get that plasma symmetry and stability as best as they can. All because of this concept right here. Well, and a few others. Neither are the electrodes. So once a plasma forms at some random spot inside the pickle, it just keeps forming there. That spot now becomes the cathode. It heats up and dominates the discharge, and it makes a small DC bias happen in this AC circuit. After I let it choose one side to become the cathode, I can flip the pickle around and the same side of the pickle lights up. So the pickle is literally- Like different pulse cycles for your fusion plan. All right. Really acting like a diode or a- And by that I mean fusion test reactor. There, there are no fusion power plants. Can you imagine doing something like this while trying to meet grid demand? And by this, I mean the equivalent of having to turn it off. It's like, oh, we had the reaction going for five minutes. Um, we need to take a one hour break. No. <laughs> Rectifier, forcing one side of the pickle to become more cathode-like and the other to become more anode-like on average. It turns out it's actually very hard to build a high voltage AC system with a plasma that has no DC bias at all. So that's why you always, yeah. yep. you always get one-sided hot pickles and one-sided Jacob's ladders. And mm -hmm. thanks for watching another- And asymmetric fusion reactors. I mean, this is one of the reasons why fusion's in a bit of a pickle. Okay, I had to ask one more. Thanks so much for the recommendation, and thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.